previously on We Live Here. You know, the fight's going to continue, and we're going to be standing right there alongside the next 50 Miss Johnsons that come in our door and try to make sure that their rights are, are adequately secured in the court and that they actually uh, get their due process in a, in a true day in court. Hey guys, it's me, Tim. And me, Camille. And on our last episode, we updated you on the legal fight between a woman named Latasha Johnson and her landlord. In this case, it wound up in the Missouri Supreme Court. If you haven't already, make sure you go back and listen to our last episode and then another episode called Housing Defenders, and that'll bring you up to speed on that particular case. And we'll just go ahead and push pause for anybody who hasn't listened so they can go back and bring themselves up to speed. If you have listened, then you know that Latasha's story has not resulted in a happy ending. But it's worth remembering that not all legal fights for housing equality ends in what is at best a mixed bag. In fact, this year marks the 70th anniversary of a landmark case that, at least in terms of the law, got rid of a legal tool used to segregate cities across America. The case is Shelley versus Kramer. And like so many landmark civil rights cases, it came from right here in St. Louis. Many of you out there are at least passingly familiar with the case. It involves a black family that migrated to the Gateway City back in the 1930s. And they were trying to find a place to settle their growing family, but they faced a big hurdle. Their dream house was in the Greater Ville, a neighborhood in North St. Louis that at the time was explicitly set aside for whites only. This was possible because of restricted deed covenants used to reinforce housing segregation all across the country. So the Shelleys used a straw man purchase to purchase a home from the Kramers, who were white. The Kramers sued to have the Shelleys kicked out, and that case went all the way up to the U.S. Supreme Court. And the high court ruled that enforcing such racially restrictive covenants was unconstitutional in St. Louis and the rest of the country. The story behind this case has been recounted in countless textbooks. And while historians may get the facts and significance of it right, There are details and human truths that can only be expressed by the descendants of J.D. and Ethel Shelley. They didn't move in the broad daylight. Mm -hmm. They moved in at night. Today, we listen to members of the Shelley family tell their story. They taught us how to love, to love each other, and and they also taught us how to love ourselves because we can't love each other without loving ourselves. From St. Louis Public Radio and PRX, this is We Live Here, a podcast for people somewhere on the woke spectrum. If you're a longtime listener of this show, then you know that one of me and Camille's favorite things to do as hosts is to shut up and just listen. Yeah, although we will cut in from time to time, this is going to be one of those kind of shows. So with that being said, this is the story of J.D. and Ethel Shelley. And my name is Lawrence C. Riley Jr. I was named after my father. He was Lawrence Clinton Sr. And he married my mom, which was Allie B. Shelley Riley, who was J.D. and Ethel's oldest child. They were in Starksville, Mississippi. Mississippi. Back then, they worked on on the farms in the fields, and they would see each other. And I think the courtship actually started with my grandfather just thinking how beautiful she was. And, and in her beauty, he, he, he got the courage to say something to her, mm-hmm. you know. And uh, from there, you know, she was shy. You know, he was the oldest of his, of his siblings, and she was the oldest of hers. It was always appropriate at, during those times to go to the families and get approval. They were too young to actually go away and be married, so their parents had to sign papers in order to allow them to be married. It was actually December the 14th, 1923, is when they actually got married. In 1939, there was a young Negro girl who worked for a white family as a maid. And at the time, the woman who she worked for, her watch came up missing. And because she was working for her, she naturally accused her of stealing that watch. So with that, she called the police. Mm -hmm. So they went down into the Negro quarters and they got the girl out. I was on a Sunday. 
And that's that's what makes me know it was so distinctive because when my grandfather told me, he said it was on Sunday and my grandmother was coming from church mm. when they actually beat, they were beating the girl. When As they were coming home, they could see the police outside her house beating her with a rubber hose. And they beat her bloody and then threw her actually into a ditch. And when they threw her in the ditch, someone said, go tell the men. And my grandfather was one of the first men to arrive. He it was a gang of them, and they went down in the ditch and got the girl, where some were actually afraid. During those times, if you went and went against Damn. what they were doing, it could have very detrimental ramifications on you and your family. But my grandfather, you know, he, he had children and he had daughters. So that's where he he just took the lead on it. And he basically went in there and got the girl. And once he got her, he said, mm-mm. Because my mother, which was the oldest of their, her name was Allie, Allie B. Shelley at the time, she was very high-spirited. Mm. So her high-spiritedness meant she would talk back and say things. So from that particular situation he knew he had to make a move he had to do a change because he had said if someone would do his child like that he would definitely be killed trying to protect his family he had relatives in Missouri in St. Louis and so he did some communications to say hey I want to move and he took my mother actually because I said she was high spirited he wanted to take her. The other kids were pretty calm, but my mom was, she was, she was really high spirited. So he took her with him and they, in the fall of, thir of, of 39, they moved to St. Louis and they lived with uncles and relatives. He started out his first job when he got to St. Louis was at Sedell Coal and Coke Company. And then later he became a porter at Charles D's Chemical Company. So in 1940, he went back and got the family because he had been working for a year. Mm -hmm. How many kids did they have at the time? At the time they had four. That number would grow. JD and Ethel were big hearted people and they took in other kids who needed a home. And soon the Shelleys were caring for not four, but eight children. It was a two bedroom flat actually, and they paid $12 a month for it. Where my grandfather and grandmother, they actually had a bedroom, mm -hmm. but the, in the living areas, that's where everybody slept, mm -hmm. where you ate and everything, living on top of each other. Mm -hmm. that's, what the, that's what the conditions were. I am Monica Beckham Holmes, the great-great-granddaughter. Wasn't it your mom that it was an incident with? Yeah, and, it was. It and, was. And it was. Once again, the high-spirited one, right? Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm not to say it like that. But, but it's the truth. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 love, the truth. I love that we're, we're, we're like the high-spirited one, and I'm like, yes, high spirited. Uh, high I think I know what that means. Yeah. Um, yes, you know what that so, means, um, the one that doesn't back down. Yeah. Right? yeah, so tell us that story of, I didn't realize that that was your mom. Yeah. Yes, mm -hmm. that was my mom. It mm -hmm. actually was a situation where um, this guy was, was was pretty much being a little more aggressive than he mm -hmm. should have been mm -hmm. with with one of her sisters. Mm -hmm. It was actually one of her sisters and and then my mom took it upon herself to to and teach him a lesson. Handle the situation. To teach him a lesson. How did he? How okay, did she, let's let's how, break yeah, this yeah. down. What, how did she, how did teach, she teach, teach him a lesson? <laughs> yeah. We're being very polite, yeah. high spirited. Teach high him a lesson. Come on, give us the details. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, you know, it was pretty rough. You know, yeah. uh, you know, Mississippi. They were known to carry knives. Now <laughs> they were known to carry <laughs> knives. Wow. Now, she didn't actually. She didn't actually go to the point where um, yeah. he was. He was. He. She. She. Her, harmed him in that way, but it was just the fact that she had to actually pull a weapon to protect herself and mm -hmm. to protect her sister. To get him off of her. Right, mm -hmm. right. Get that away. that 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 uh, weapon stopped it basically. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that um that made it um, a situation where they knew it was getting too crowded and, and the neighborhood was getting a little rough. Mm -hmm. So they wanted to actually move move, move the family there. out of there. Mm -hmm. At the time my grandfather was working pretty good. Mm -hmm. 
and he was making decent money, and he wanted to actually buy a car so they could transport the kids and get everybody around, where my grandmother said, no, J.D. Yes, we need the house. We need the house because mm-hmm. we got these kids. Mm-hmm. <laughs> the kids need somewhere to live. That makes sense, right? You know, he wants a car. car. She's like, uh, no, we're doing something yeah. different. Exactly, exactly. We need a house. <laughs> All these kids, right? We, we will get the car later. <laughs> yeah, we'll get that later. Yes. My grandmother was working as a maid, mm-hmm. and she was also doing cleaning. At Welts Baby Carriage. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Welts Baby Carriage. And she was also doing, you know, uh, laundry where mm-hmm. she would do ironing for people's mm-hmm. and things of that nature. So and sewing. Mm-hmm. Yep. So they had saved their money because they had saved their money because, like I said, my grandfather wanted to buy that car. So they had saved their money, but then they still didn't have enough money to actually get a house. My grandmother was a devout Christian, and she was at a Church of God in Christ. And the pastor at the time was uh, Elder Robert Bishop. Mm -hmm. He was the pastor. And he was also a real estate agent. He went to the congregation and asked the congregation to assist, and they did. He also knew a white realtor, and her name was Miss Hackman for Hackman Realty Company. And that's who actually initially purchased that property. And then they did a quick deed claim and signed it over to my grandparents. Initially, they were looking for, mm-hmm. when they originally, they were looking for housing mm-hmm. in, the, in, the seg- in the segregated areas. Area. Mm-hmm. But it was so crowded, they couldn't find anything accommodating to their needs. It was more or less, where can I give my kids a good opportunity? Right to grow up in a good, nice neighborhood where they have better opportunities. And that's what it was with them. I can remember my grandmother telling me that um, when they got the house, she thanked God for blessing them. And she was so, so excited. It was really good memories for them all. It was Mm -hmm. a predominantly white area. Mm -hmm. And they knew that there could be possible mm-hmm. right. problems coming with them purchasing that particular property. They didn't move in the broad daylight. Mm-hmm. They moved in at night. Right. My grandfather was walking home, mm-hmm. and the police stopped him and said, what are you doing in this neighborhood, basically? Mm-hmm. And that's when he said, I'm going home. And it was asked him where he lived. And he told them where he lived. They said, no, you don't live there. And he showed them the paperwork where he did live there. Mm -hmm. And that's what brought the attention to them even being there. How long had they been there when that incident happened? Probably about a week. week, It was very short. It was about a week week Mm -hmm. or something. When did sort of the trouble with the neighbors start? Pretty pretty much immediately after. Mm -hmm. That's when the uh, Kramers wanted to go around and have a petition signed to get our grandparents out of the neighborhood, basically, and out of the house. They didn't even know, really, that my grandparents even owned the house. They just wanted them out and said that they wasn't supposed to be in that particular neighborhood. The Kramers, they went around to get a petition signed and they got signatures, but they didn't get enough signatures. They wasn't able to get them out of um, the house at the time. That's when the court process and all that started coming by. They went and hired an attorney. Mm -hmm. They hired a gentleman named Gerald Seegers. He was the nephew of Martin Seegers, the founder of the Marcus Avenue Improvement Association. Mm -hmm. So there was an association that was in place during that time that prevented any other races other than whites Mm -hmm. from moving into those areas. Mm -hmm. And they then filed a grievance because he found legislation that that said that it was unlawful for them to live in that area. One day, uh, a uh, court-assigned person came to their house and served them papers Mm -hmm. um, to, uh, to appear in court. Grandparents went and got George Vaughn. He was an attorney who helped the elder bishop, who was the real estate. He helped. He was one of the attorneys who always helped black families get Mm -hmm. into these homes. Mm -hmm. 
it was like well, a movement. It right, was like a movement. What he did, That's what it was. Yeah, because what he did, he 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 tapped into each every African American attorney mm-hmm. and asked them to come on board and side with them to get this thing going. That's how the revenue was coming in, and everybody and it, it was just African American attorneys that wanted to uh, be a part. The initial ruling um, from uh, Judge William Comer. He ruled in favor of our parent, of our grandparents. It went to the appellate court, and the appellate court ruled in favor of the Kramers. Right. And then it went to the state appellate court, mm-hmm. and they also upheld it, mm-hmm. upheld the ruling at the appellate court. Mm-hmm. So there was no other place for it to go but to the Supreme, Supreme court. court. At the time, mm-hmm. there was quite a few segregation mm-hmm. cases all over America. Right. And Thurgood Marshall was on the team. George Vaughn was on the team. There's a few other, because the NAACP was really involved with most of these situations. They looked and said, okay, which one has the best probability of us winning? Yes. And that's when they put more resources into our case mm-hmm. because everything really had been done legally. Our grandparents did have the capability to purchase that particular property. Mm -hmm. So it came down to that. If you can afford to buy it, Mm -hmm. you can own it. He did not think for one minute, even though he was faithful, Mm -hmm. he had that human doubt, right? Mm -hmm. Because they initially won, the other two times it was overturned. Mm -hmm. So he, he was unsure if and he didn't know if it was even worth their time. He even told, I remember he said, he told grandma, mm-hmm. he said, I don't know if this is worth our time. Do you think this is worth our time? And she said, yeah, it's worth our time because if we win, we get to stay here and mm-hmm. raise the kids. In May, they actually did the ruling on May the 3rd. Mm-hmm. A telegram came. That's how they got the information. So it yeah, went, he it went, actually went to both attorneys. And then that's when uh, George Vaughn gave the information to to our grandparents. He said he was just thrown, and and him and him and my grandma hugged and kissed, and they shouted, and they went and told everybody. You know, it was more or less we had won, right? We had won. We over we overcame what we didn't think we could. Totally excited because they knew how many doors this whole decision had opened. Even though the highest court in America had ruled that the Shelley family had every right to live in their new home, that didn't mean the racist intimidation stopped. Mm -hmm. And then once they ran them home and then they found out where they lived, then that's when they just, you know, wanted to go and demolish the, the, the property and everything. The Shelleys had won their case, and in the process, changed the legal landscape across America. But day-to-day life was still difficult. It was pretty much with the kids, the thing more so that uh, them being, you know, bullied or ran home or thrown at. And mm-hmm. and then once they ran them home and then they found out where they lived, then that's when they just you know, wanted to go and demolish the the, the property and everything. Um, My grandfather... He was tough. He really was. My grandfather, he was was tough. He he got him away. Yeah, he was was um, Mm well-known, and that's why he left Mississippi, because he knew, you know, if, 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 if he saw or he could see any kind of situation occurring, that he would be able to handle it. You know, they still bust out the windows, wrote on the walls, everything, but it didn't move them. It didn't run them away. They still stayed and stuck it out. And that's when they, he, you know, the other black family started, you know, coming in. As more black families moved into the neighborhood, white families left. First to North St. Louis County, and when blacks began moving into these areas, white families kept moving west. And this housing picture generally holds today. 
African Americans in the St. Louis region are largely segregated in the northern half of the region, while white people are in the southern and western parts. As for J.D. and Ethel Shelley, they stayed in their home for a while, but as their family kept growing, they moved to a bigger place nearby. My parents uh, lived upstairs from them, from my great-grandparents, and I would come, we would come home from school every day. We didn't even come through our parents' door. We came through our great-grandparents' door. Mm -hmm. When we would come in that door, we would see him sitting there in the front of the TV watching, watching The, ball the game. Price is Right, the ball, <laughs> the ball game. He loved oh, the Cardinals. Yes. Yeah, he yes. loved the Cardinals. And she was right there in that kitchen baking cakes and and singing oh my and God. singing and gospel singing hymns gospel. Yeah. and then uh, uh, my biggest thing I'm still working I'm still doing today all the old remedies that she taught me with different things uh, when you get sick and the, you know the hot toddies and the, the Vaseline and warming it up and mm. when your skin is not too you're too chafed all those old remedies I still keep with me today And yet, while the couple raised their children and kept their family close, the Supreme Court case was seldom discussed. I'm Tawana Beckham, the great-granddaughter of J.D. and Ethel Shelley. I sat in a classroom mm -hmm. and was told about the Shelley versus Kramer case. I had no idea. And I'm like, what? Wait a minute. <laughs> and I remember going home like, why, you know, mm -hmm. I was just shocked. I was shocked. I was very proud. My classmates were like, that's not your grandfather. You're lying. And I'm like, no, I promise you <laughs> that is my grandfather. So that is how I found out mm -hmm. about the case. But I, I was so proud. That was a very proud moment for me, definitely. In the late 1980s, a parade commemorating the family and their contribution to civil rights filled the neighborhood. It was then that the quiet, elderly couple began to open up about their place in American history. Just so proud and boasting because it was really a surprise to him. Even though all what all he had been through, it when that parade became, that's when he was like, Wow. That's when he started That's talking about it. That's when he it started more. telling the younger us as the younger kids about, you know why we had this and you know why we got that. And that's how I was able to learn because he was still alive and he was able to tell me why we were walking down that street for that parade at that time because I didn't know and I didn't understand until after that. So, and I just, I just carry it with me. It is, it's the best thing that I could say that ever happened in our family. The Shelley family no longer owns the original house at 4600 Labadee Avenue, though there is a plaque in the front yard, which anyone can see if they drive by. But Lawrence, Monica, and other family members stay in touch with the current occupants, and they've approached them about buying back the Shelley home in the hopes of preserving it for future generations. Our children really if we don't teach them the history of our culture, they'll never know. They'll never know, and it's lost because a lot of it isn't being taught in the schools anymore. You know, it's just general American history, but black history is not being implemented in the school systems anymore. They taught us how to love to love each other and to, and they also taught us how to love ourselves because we can't love each other without loving ourselves. Right. So um, that there was, um, that helped me out a whole lot because I feel like family is, is love, you know, and we all we have, you know, once you, when you don't have family, you pretty much don't have, hardly have anything. So they taught us that, and that, that word is really big in our family, love, right. um, because they were two, exam two people that were really examples to a whole lot of us, a whole lot of us. We all are very proud that we have a heritage of family who, who in their own way, mm -hmm gave something to a movement mm -hmm. of people to, to open up opportunities for African Americans in America.
next time on We Live Here. Racial restrictive covenants were sort of like the stepchildren of Association of Realtors Code of Ethics. So when you guys signed up to, to honor that, it was like, wow, like, this is perfect. Come back and sort of put a period on the end of that sentence. Reconcile the issues that were caused by real estate practices in the United States over years. We Live Here is produced by me, Tim Lloyd. And me, Camille Stanley. Alana Sistrunk is our associate producer. And Robert Peterson is our boss. He's the director of radio programming here at St. Louis Public Radio. And from St. Louis Public Radio and PRX, this is We Live Here. Support for this podcast comes from the Corporation for Public Broadcasting.